Now, last week, if you um, are a visitor with us, you're super welcome. I see some faces, some visitors here. You are welcome. Um, a lot of men in the church last week went on a little hike. And uh, at one point in time in this um, hike, on the final day, uh, Mog and I, we were walking right at the back. Our job was to pick up all the rubbish that maybe people will be dropping as they go along unbeknownst to them and to take all the signs off that would point people to where they're supposed to go. And when people get lost, to get them to go in the right direction. And there was this one moment in time whereby uh, Mog and I were bringing up the rear and one of the guys had a stone in his shoe. And he sat down to get the stone out and everything, and the, and the, and the majority of the group kind of moved on while he was just sorting himself out. And we were going through a small little village, and uh, he finally got himself sorted again, got the big backpack on, strapped in, clicked in, ready to go, and he shot off like, a, like an arrow out of a bow into the wrong direction. And he, and he was walking like strong, and, and I was looking at him, and we were supposed to walk along the Millennium Way, isn't that right, Mog? And Mog and I were looking at the sign going that way, and he's disappearing there around a corner. And he was so determined, and he was so ready, and he was carrying the load, and he was moving fast in the wrong direction. Today we're going to start a series that's going to last five weeks on the book of Jude, a small little book in the New Testament, actually one of the smallest books in the New Testament. It's the second to last book, 25 verses in total. And Jude, who writes this book, says that I want to talk to you about all the good things of our faith. I want to talk to you about our Savior. I've got so much to tell you, but we're somehow going in the wrong direction. There's something that I have to change in terms of my message. I've got to tell you something else. I've got to prevent you from going down this road. And ultimately, me and Mog had to take swift action and get that gentleman saved and rescued and brought back to the right place so he could follow and walk towards where he was supposed to go. And so for the next five weeks, I want to encourage you to get your Bibles in your quiet times, your times with God, your personal worship times when you're alone with the Lord, whether you're driving in your car and listening to music or whether you're at home reading from your, through your Bible or perhaps in your life groups, to be in the book of Jude and to take these 25 verses into your heart and into your soul, into your mind, so that we can journey together as a church congregation to pick up on what it may be that the Holy Spirit would like to say to us as we move from here to the end of the series. So let's get straight to work. If you've got a Bible today, I'd love for you to just open your Bible now um, at the book of Jude. And out of the 25 verses, we're going to look at the first four only today. We're only going to work through four verses. If you don't have a Bible, these gentlemen would like to give you one. If you don't own a Bible at all, feel free to take it home. It's a gift from us to you. Write your name at the front and feel free to write in it and underline it if you're going to take it home. And we're going to read the first four verses, and it starts like this. The author writes, and he says this, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. Jude is short for Judas. You see, Jesus had four brothers through his earthly father, Joseph and his earthly father, Mary. Four half-brothers. We read about it in Matthew 13, 55. It says, uh, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas was Jesus' four brothers. Now, uh, Christian history and tradition tells us that perhaps Judas got tired of having to explain to those around him, no, I'm the other Judas. I'm not the one who betrayed Jesus. No, that's another guy. He went and he hung himself. I, I'm, I'm Judas, the brother of, oh, just forget about it. Call me Jude. And so that's what happens here. Jude, a servant of Jesus and brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God, the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. Who is he writing to in this moment? Believers. He's not writing to the world. It's not to those who haven't met Christ Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. He's writing to those who would say in this moment, I belong to Jesus. 
I am a Christ follower. He's writing to them. And he says to them, May mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Dear saints, I wanted to talk about all the fun stuff pertaining to our faith and Christ Jesus, our church. I wanted to celebrate our Savior and the things that bring us together, that which makes us family, but I realized it is time to fight. I had to go in a different direction to contend for the faith because something somewhere has gone wrong, he's saying. What's gone wrong? Well, he says in verse 4, certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation. Ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. This is what has gone wrong. This is where somehow you've, you've gone off the track. You've missed the signs. The, 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 it wasn't clear to you. Somebody had said something or pointed you in the wrong direction. And I need to fight. Jude is saying that we have to contend for the faith that was once and for all delivered to the saints. Somewhere along the line, the simplicity, the clarity, the integrity of our faith has been compromised. A message, a purpose other than that which was originally entrusted to us had taken root. And dear friends, I am concerned that in the church of Jesus Christ today, the same can be said. What Jude is contending for here 2,000 plus years ago, I'm afraid that the same may be said for the church today. Somewhere unnoticed by most, the message, our purpose, our faith, our mission has been altered. So how does one identify what has gone wrong? How does one see what has become corrupted? What, what is counterfeit? What is a copy? Well, the way to do that is to look at the original. Would you agree? You have to go back to that which is right and pure. And then you have to compare whatever you've got at the moment against that and see if they match. So we need to go back to the very beginning. You see, most of us here in this building will understand and know that there's a problem. And the problem is this. Human sin and its results. God created human beings so that we might have fellowship with them and, and that we can serve as faithful managers of His creation. God was to be king who reigned over heaven and over earth, and we were to be His royal family, those through whom He would implement His reign here on earth. Yet we sinned against God. We disobeyed Him because of our prideful desire to be equal to Him. We were not satisfied with fellowship with the King as His prince and His princess. No, we wanted to be king and queen ourselves. Our sin was not just some minor offense, something a holy God could just ignore and forget about, but it was rather outright rebellion against His rule and against His reign. And the result of sin was pervasive brokenness. And today it's all around us. If you look at the world around you, there's so much beauty and there's so much treasure and there's so much that's good, but there's also so much that's just broken. And politicians have been trying forever to fix it. And nations have been raging war one after the other to try and get to a place of wholeness. Yet it's broken. Something has gone wrong in our relationship with God, with one another, and with creation itself. We shattered that gift of divine fellowship that was perfect with God right at the beginning when He made the world. And this is the primary, overarching, terrible, terrifying problem facing mankind today. They don't know the God who made them. They don't serve the God who created them. And for limited, sinful creatures like us, overcoming this problem is impossible. 
We can't fix it. So God stepped in and He sent His Son. He sent Jesus. He sent Him on a mission. Go to earth to where I originally gave dominion to Adam and to Eve. And go undo the effects of sin. Go and fix the problem. Jesus, bring reconciliation. That word reconciliation. Bring reconciliation between mankind, my creation, and me. Go and bring the world back to rights. So Jesus comes to earth and He lives a perfect life in relationship with His Father. Filled with the Holy Spirit. He never sins. He never gets it wrong. Never one bad thought. Never one bad action. He does the right thing every moment of His life while He is on earth. And when the appropriate time comes, He willingly gives His life on a cross. The Bible says, so that many, a ransom for many, all who would call on His name could be saved. He becomes a substitute. He dies now, plays for the sin of all mankind. He gives His life to pay the price that sin demands. Most of you know this. And in His giving His life, He makes an opportunity for ours to be saved. Jesus conquers Satan, sin, sickness, and death, and He's resurrected three days later. That is the hope of our message. The hope is not that He went to the cross. The hope is that He came back to life after He was killed on a cross. He conquers sin. Soon afterwards, He would ascend to heaven to rule and reign at the Father's right hand, but not before He gives His followers. That's you and me for most of us in this building, the following mission. Are you ready? He says this, he says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Go and make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. Listen, if you're a follower of Christ Jesus, this is your mission. Three things in this mission. One, go and tell the world, go and make disciples. Go and tell them there's a sin problem. Tell them about the consequences of the sin problem. Tell them what would happen if they were to die in their sins apart from me. And then tell them there's great news that I came and I died in their place. That everybody who would call on the name of Jesus shall be saved. Tell them the good news. Make disciples. Then those who choose for Jesus, because some will reject Him. Most will reject Him, the Bible says. But those who would accept the message, you've got to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And it wasn't the methodology that Jesus was giving there. He wasn't telling them that when you put people under the water, remember to say, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. He was saying, They have to understand that there is a giving of self uh, to equal measures to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Some churches have this thing about Father God. Some churches are all about Jesus and some churches are all about the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, no, we are a God three in one. Equal measure, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So you teach them about me. Those who accept me, baptize them. And once they've been baptized, Teach them everything you know about me. And keep going. Don't stop. As you go, the rest of your life, this is your mission. So the question is, where are you at in terms of your mission? This last week, what does this week look like for you? This last month, this year, how are you going in your mission You see, there's a deception, there's a fallacy that has brought Christians today to believe that my Christianity consists out of my church attendance. If I come to church on Sunday, that proves I'm right with God. I'm saying, I think we've been deceived. We've somehow gone down the wrong track. We're marching ahead with a heavy backpack, singing onward Christian soldiers, but we're not fulfilling the mission Jesus gave us. And surely, he says, I'm with you till the end of the age. If you do this, you won't be doing it alone. He says, if this is your life's work, if this is your career, if this is your aspirations, if this is your dreams, I'm with you till the end, Jesus says. He's chosen us to be his agents of reconciliation. 
God chose for us to work with Jesus in this mission of bringing the world back to Him. Jesus came once and for all. And have you ever heard people say, well, if Jesus came today, I'll believe. If Jesus was to just appear and speak to me, man, I'll believe then. You know what? Jesus came, but through the followers of Jesus Christ, through the body, generation after generation, they're to look at us. As we represent Jesus, every generation, people are to see Christians, Christ followers, little Christ representatives going like, I see something different. I see Jesus. All this is from God, the Bible says, who through Christ reconciled us to Himself and gave us the ministry of what? Reconciliation. I want you to say this with me. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to Himself. Say this word, reconciliation. reconciliation. Your mission is reconciliation between an almighty God, creator, and a broken world. To reconcile the two. He says here, this is our ministry. Your ministry isn't in worship. Your ministry isn't in sound, in video. Your ministry isn't in the kids' work. Your ministry isn't going onto the streets. Your ministry is a ministry of reconciliation. Everywhere you go, Paul goes on, he writes, he says, that is, in Christ God has reconciled the world to Himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. That's the message He wants us to take forward. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 20, therefore we are ambassadors of Christ, meaning I represent the kingdom wherever I go. I don't represent Rousseau anymore. I don't represent my aspirations, my dreams, my future, my hopes. I represent the kingdom. I'm a visitor in this place. Hey man, I'm a temporary alien. <laughs> this world is no longer my own. I, I represent another kingdom. That is who I am. I'm an ambassador to the kingdom of God, making His appeal. God making His appeal through us. So when you come and you share the goodness of Christ Jesus, you have to have faith in your heart that it is as though God is speaking to that person through you. That's good. You may be saying, but I don't know theology. I'm so broken. I, I, I just, I, I'm, I'm, I'm scared I'm going to do it wrong. Listen, in faith, if I say, you know what? There's a problem in this world. It's broken. But there's Jesus, the Son of God, who came to bring hope. He loves you so much that He wants you to hear this. In this moment, God is speaking to this person. I have to have faith because Scripture says God making His appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, Paul writes, to reconcile to God. For our sake He made Him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in Him we may become the righteousness of God. Because we experience intimate fellowship with God through Christ, we are also partners with Him in His mission of reconciliation. Jesus started something we're supposed to carry on with. He began something we're supposed to take the ball. You know, you think about it, this World Cup fever. Today, you, you know, you take the ball and you pass it on and the next guy goes. God sent Jesus on a mission. And we are to share in that mission according to Scripture. By the power of the Holy Spirit within us, we are to co-labor with Jesus to continue the, mess, the mission of reconciliation. And for the avoidance of doubt, there is a mission that God gave Jesus. And I want to break it down to you in five easy steps. If you're a note taker, take notes of these. This is the five easy steps of what Jesus came to do and we're supposed to continue. Are you ready? The first is this. Jesus was sent by God in the power of the Holy Spirit. Have you ever tried to do things in the kingdom apart from the Holy Spirit and your own strength? It's horrible, isn't it? It's dry. There's no anointing. It just doesn't work. We're supposed to move in the power of the Holy Spirit. How do you remain in the power of the Holy Spirit? Well, you're in the Word of God every day. You're praying without ceasing. You're worshiping. You're in a fellowship of believers. You're pursuing the things of God. You're filled with the Spirit. We have to go in the power of the Holy Spirit, number one. Number two, Jesus was sent to proclaim the good news. We have to proclaim the good news. I, 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 I hear this thing in Christian circles. It says, well, you know what? We have always got to share the gospel and if, whenever possible use words. Have you heard that before? Can I, can, I just say, can I just say, that is fallacy. That is not Scripture. 
Scripture says, how can they believe if they've not heard? You know what happens with that attitude that like, I'm going to show you by my lifestyle that I'm a Christian. You know what, what that does? It brings glory to you. It doesn't bring glory to God. Because what happens is people go like, Rihanna is such a wonderful person, but she never gets angry. Ben is so good, you know, he's always full of, full of laughs, and you know what, he's such a good guy, he's just, he, he's different. And if, if he never shares why he's different, if he never talks about the cause of, of, of his actions, if he never says, this is why I do this, I'm just thinking you're a great guy. Jesus went from town to town to proclaim the goodness of the kingdom with his mouth. And then was sent, number three, to enact the good news. It's got to be proof of what you proclaim. It's got to be some evidence that what we're saying is true. Otherwise, what have we got? I mean, how, how is our message different from other religions, from other faith groups? If it's just information, Jesus healed the sick. He hung out with the destitute. He loved sinners. He, you know, he would hold people others would just not even want to look at. He would raise the dead. He would drive out the demonic. We're, we're to do the same. Number four, Jesus was sent to form a community of good news. The community of Jesus' followers live under God's reign, demonstrating love and justice as servants of God and of one another. Does the Bible not say, come, outdo one another in showing honor? It's by your love for one another that the world will know that you belong to me. If you are running a race and it's you and Jesus, let me tell you, you're missing it. Jesus formed the community of believers. He wants for us to be in fellowship with one another. And then five, Jesus was sent out to consummate the good news through his death and his resurrection. And here some of you will say to me, oh, but you're so... I can see point one, point two, point three, and point four, but we were not called to the ministry of death and resurrection. And I will say, does the Bible not tell us every day to pick up a cross? Does the Bible not say every day to die to self and to live unto Christ? Every day I've got to lay my dreams aside. I've got to lay my dreams and my hopes and my desires. And I've got to say, here I am, all of me. How would you want to use me today? How would you want to work through me today? These five points, Jesus was sent by God in the power of the Holy Spirit to proclaim the good news, to enact the good news, to form a community of the good news, and to consummate the good news through His death and His resurrection. And I want to ask you, is this your mission every day? Is this you? Think about it as I'm holding up the mirror of Scripture, as I'm proclaiming these things to you. What you have to do in this moment is you have to decide, is Rousseau just ranting? Is he just rambling? Or could this just be the message of Scripture? Could this just be what the Bible is actually teaching? Are you living by the power of the Holy Spirit? Are you proclaiming the good news? Are you enacting the good news? Are you flourishing within a community of the good news? And are you dying to self and living to Him every single day of your life? Many, most Christians today that I can see do not live like this. They just don't. I don't see this broadly in Christianity today. Why? Because I believe there's been a great deception. Jude said, for certain people have crept in unnoticed. Long ago was designated for the condemnation ungodly people who pervert the grace of God. You know when you pervert something? You take something that's right and pure and true and you just change it a little. You don't even have to change it completely. You, you, you change it so there's enough of the original left so that people still think that's right. But enough newness or change or whatever so that you completely send people in the wrong direction. Jude said, who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. And when I look around me at the church there at large, I, I'm grieved. I am. You see, in Revelation, we read about what Christians refer to as end-time prophecy. Revelation, if you don't know, is just the very next book along from Jude. We read about everything that is supposedly yet to happen that Jesus by His Spirit revealed to this man called John some of the things that is to come in end times. People are quite relaxed because they sense, well, this is things yet to come. One day these things will be, but not yet. 
They're somewhere in the distant future. But I wonder if John, under the leading of the Holy Spirit, wasn't, wasn't warning us of something we need to be aware of today. And I want to read a little bit for you from Revelation here. Revelation 13, he says, He required everyone, great and small. This is the authority of the day. This is the ruler of the day. This is the world power of the day, as John is writing. He says, this guy, he requires of everyone, small and great, rich and poor. In other words, it doesn't matter who you are or where you are from, whether you are free or a slave, to be given a mark on the right hand or on the forehead. Have you ever heard this stuff? Okay. And no one could buy or sell anything without that mark, which was either the name of the beast or the number representing the name. And for millennia, Christians have enjoyed their conspiracy theories and what this may mean and what this may look like. And I remember when I was growing up, perhaps some of you as well, I remember watching old Christian flicks, right, whereby Jesus would come again. And then those who are left behind got branded with a 666, and they got something on the hand, and then they couldn't buy, and they couldn't trade, and they were ostracized, and they were hunted down. Maybe it was just me, but some of you may have seen something like that as well. And for a while, people kind of thought that. And then in more recent times, they thought, no, 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 it's not going to be that. It won't be a tattoo, you know, or or what it's going to be, it's going to be a microchip. It's going to be like your bank card, you know, that you get a chip in your hand or a chip on your forehead. And when you get to the bank, you know, you can just scan your hand. Or you can just be scanned at the supermarket and that's your bank transactions and switches on your lights and carries your ID. And some companies are actually doing that now. I've seen it. It's wonderful. Actually, it's super convenient. You can't lose your stuff. You just get to the office, you swipe your hand, switches your lights on, you know, your salary get paid into that. Super cool. It's your bank card. But the book of Revelation is prophetic and poetic and picture language throughout. You see, the forehead represents the way you think. The right hand represents the way you do. Could it be that what the Holy Spirit was saying here was something deeper than what we've picked up in the past? We're living in a time where your worldview as a Christian can cost you quite a lot. My brother is a young PhD student in the scientific community of Perth uh, Perth University in Australia. His worldview, a creationist worldview, a Christian worldview that God made everything can cost him everything. One conversation can ruin him. They are so aggressive in that university against anything other than an evolution worldview. I was speaking to Mog about this. My little brother Dylan. It can cost him everything just because he thinks in a different way. More and more we read and we see in our news channels business owners being sued and persecuted for their views on family and biblical marriage. If you don't think about marriage or family the way we think about it anymore, we don't want you in our community. We don't want you to trade amongst us. We don't want you to do business in our midst, and we will get you out of here. If you don't think like us and you don't do like us, we will ostracize you. I hope you get the point. So Revelation goes on. It says, wisdom is needed here. Let the one with understanding solve the meaning of the number of the beast, for it is the number of man. It's the number of man. His number is 666. See, Scripture teaches us that actually the number of God, the perfect number is seven. The perfect number, you know, it's God's number. The number that represents man is six. And I just wonder, I just wonder, could it perhaps be that when we get to that place where mankind elevates themselves above God, where it's all about me, where this world is all about me and my rights and my desires and my truth and my life and my family and my future and my home and my dreams and my happiness. Me, me, me. Could it be that we're actually seeing prophecy in action around us already? We're waiting for something that I think is here. In our midst. And we've been deceived. We don't know it. You know what? It's not limited to the world out there. And this is what grieves me. It's in the church. That deception has come in here. Into the church of Jesus Christ. 
Jesus came to rescue me. Jesus came to save me. To cause my dreams to come true. To secure the life I always wanted. To help me with the perfect family. To ensure I have happiness. And although there's a measure of truth to this, there has been a perversion of such truth. And we go around and we say, like, even if I was the only person on earth, Jesus would have still have come and died for me. And yes, I also believe that, but it's not the whole story. There's more. We have lost sight of the fact that we were bought, we were bought at a price. A terrible price, actually. The blood of Christ Jesus. We read in Scripture things like this, Colossians 3, 3. For you have died to this life. You have died to this life. That means your hopes and aspirations can't be anymore. The big house I want, the car I want, the career I want, the things of this world. It, it, you've died to this world. You now live for a different kingdom. You're an ambassador here anymore, no longer a citizen. It says in Colossians 3, 4, when Christ who is your life, that means everything I have is now unto Jesus. It's for you. Everything I own, everything I have, everything I can do, my, my, my talents, my abilities, it's yours, Jesus. And so young people come to me and they ask me, well, I'm, I'm really concerned. What should I do? Should I become a lawyer? Should I become an accountant? Should I become a doctor? Should I go travel? I'm like, it doesn't matter. As long as you go for Jesus. If you're going to be an accountant, bend everything in your will towards Him. Be the best accountant that this island man has ever seen. And let people know you're that way because of Jesus. Man, if you're going to be an athlete, be the best athlete. But let them know you're competing for the kingdom. Everything you do is now His because He is your life. I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. Galatians 2.20 says, I've been crucified. <laughs> the Josh that once was there is no more. The Rianne that once existed is no more. Malcolm is no more. You've been crucified. 1 Corinthians 6, Or do you not know that the body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? Yes, it matters. Your body matters. What you do to your body, what, it matters because the Spirit of God is within you. Whom you have from God, you are not your own, Paul says. You are not your own. And I know in this moment, many of you will listen going like that. It's just not the message I'm used to. It's just not a message I want to receive. But I think what we've done is we've, we've, we've conditioned ourselves to gloss over such truths that it doesn't impact us anymore. Oh, yeah, I'm no longer my own. You know, so what? It says, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. You, you, what you do, how you do it, when you do it, glorify God with your body. Somewhere along the line, it has become all about us. And I believe that's the great thing that, that Jude wants to contend against. It's, it's, it's become a humanistic society with a human, humanistic influences in the church. And it's all about me. And Jude is trying to say, no, it's all about him. We think the enemy has deceived the church and we fight on different fronts of things like biblical marriage or sexuality or sensuality or hyper grace or the sanctity of life and abortion and gender confusion, all those things. But the reality is those are but fruit of a bigger problem. And the bigger problem is me, self. What am I going to get out of this thing? <laughs> I want to come once a week to church, hear a great message, and go away and just live my life. And it, it, it frightens me that in Scripture we have passages that would say, people would say, I prophesied in your name, I cast out demons, I healed in your name, and Jesus says, I didn't know you. I just didn't know you. I think the deception in the church today is that it's become about self. And the sentiment of the church is that as long as you love God and you're happy, it'll all work out in the end. Listen, just Jesus died for you. 
It'll all work out in the end. And I wonder, where do you see that in Scripture? Paul writes of various, of various guys who used to labor with him for Christ. He said, this guy fell away. That guy fell away. This one's no longer running with us. That one's no longer anywhere to be seen. Jesus tells parables and he says, of those who think they belong to me, there'll be goats and there'll be sheep. There's ten virgins. There's five who will come in and five who won't come in. It won't just work out in the end. It's a fallacy we need to wake up from. Jude says, for certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for condemnation. Ungodly people who pervert the grace of God into sensuality and deny our Master and our Lord Jesus Christ. Who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality, meaning, do what you want, man. Do what you want. Jesus loves you. I mean, He loves, He really loves you. Do what you want. He's forgiven your sins past and present and future. And you remember when he died, all the sins were in future, man. Just do what you want. God's grace is sufficient. What they've done, they've perverted the grace of God. And deny our master and Lord Jesus Christ. And you'll say, well, I have never once in my life as the words come out of my mouth that Jesus is not my Lord and my Savior. I will never say a thing like that. But I'm saying... So many of us through our actions and our life decisions and our choices deny Him through our lifestyle. You're not Lord. You're not Master. You fit into my schedule. I have a schedule. I have a plan. It's on a wall. It's a chart. And I've got some space for you here, Jesus. There's like a little slot for you there. You be Lord and Master then. God, I can never repay you. That's got to be the cry of our heart, rather. What you've done what Jesus did for me, even if you give me all of eternity to say thank you and try and labor, it'll be a labor in vain to try and repay what Jesus, what you did for me on the cross. That's why every day today I will give my life to you. It's yours. Do with it what you will. Let me co-labor with you. Let me be on mission with you for you are worthy because my life is no longer my own. That's why Jude, brother of Jesus, could write, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ. You know, today the sentiment in churches is like this. Me and Jesus, we're, 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 we're brothers, man. He's my big brother, and I'm next to him. We're, we're bros. He loves me, and he kind of did an awesome thing for me. Me and Jesus, we're just going to do this thing together. The one guy who actually had a leg to stand on to be like that, Jude, who was a half-brother of Jesus, the one who could say, ah, I was with him. I grew up with him. I saw him. I wiped his nose for him. You know, all these things. The guy who had a leg to stand on, he says, no, I'm a servant of Jesus. And you know what happens here is that in the original language, I had to look at it, that word that Jude uses is a word called doulos, slave. He's not saying I'm a servant. A servant and a slave is different. He's saying I'm a slave to Jesus. I'm a slave. And that slave, one who gives himself up for another's will, whose service is used by Christ in extending and advancing His cause among men. Not mine. His cause. Jude says, I am a slave to His cause. That's what my life is all about now. And I know in some of your hearts right now, there's a battle raging. Just kind of, that can't be right or so. And I think self is fighting to cling to the throne of your life. For some of you, this message is simply not acceptable. It's too harsh. It's not the kind of message I want to hear on a Sunday morning. Jesus came for us, my comfort, my happiness, my family, my career, my job, my money, my life. But I've come here today to contend for the faith. Because that's not what I see in Scripture. In actual fact, what I see in Scripture is that those who gave themselves to Jesus, those who were closest to Him, His many set aside to be in his inner circle, would all lose their life for him. None of them went away of the original apostles to go farming or go build a life again. And just live. They would all lose their life for Jesus ultimately. It's yours. It's yours. Do what you may. And today I look at the churches around us and what I see is just, it's difficult to tell who's Christian and who's not Christian. Have you ever seen that or felt like that? It's very difficult. We watch the same movies. We, we, we enjoy the same music. 
The same Netflix. We, we do the same things. You know, I mean, divorce and remarriage in the church is as rife as it is outside the church. It's very difficult today to tell the difference between those who belong to God and those who don't. But true faith, true faith that Jude would contend for, we can see in Hebrews 11. In Hebrews 11, it says this, Some were tortured, refused to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with a sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world is not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. Hebrews 11, verse 35 to 38. And they didn't live for themselves. They lived for Him. And they gave it all for him. And I want to conclude with this. I, I needed to start this series by just holding up again and reminding us again what it's all about. Otherwise, the rest of Jude is not going to really make sense for us. Too many Christians meet Jesus and then go on about the business of building their lives. The only thing that has changed is now I ask Jesus to give me what I wanted in the first place. I now pray that you now fulfill my dreams. I went after it alone, but Jesus, I mean, maybe you can weigh in and make sure I get what I want. But Jesus would say to you today, I've called you to count the cost. I've called you to count the cost. If you're going to follow me, you have to lay down your life. If we're going to follow Jesus wholeheartedly, our, our lives just cannot contain all the things we would have done otherwise. We cannot be a people who try to fit Jesus in. He's asked us for more than that. And I think the greatest deception today in the church, one of the greatest deceptions, and I'll finish with this, one of the greatest deceptions in church today is that there's the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. Somewhere along the line, somebody helped you to pray a prayer. And because you prayed a prayer somewhere along the line, somebody told you you are now saved. I think it's the greatest deception in the church today. I think there's too many men and women who have no fruit to show any evidence to point towards that their lives belong to Jesus. But I prayed a prayer somewhere. If you go from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, you have been severed from the kingdom of darkness. That's an old life. Are you really saved? It's the title of this message. Are you really saved? I was grappling with it this week and I had a different message. You'll be looking at your outline going, this makes no sense. Welcome. I wrote two messages this week. I wrote the first one and it just felt, am I really saved? Rousseau, are you really saved? Is there evidence in your life that Jesus is your Lord? Or is it because you do a lot of church activities? Is that what I will point to on the last day as I stand before Jesus? Look at my schedule of busyness for church stuff. Count the cost. We were sent to continue the ministry of Jesus to proclaim and to demonstrate the good news of God's reign that it has come through Jesus. Jesus. We are to invite people to be reconciled to God. That's why we are here. If that's not what you're doing, God be with you. And today I'm going to invite you to come to communion. And, and really, I'm, I'm going to invite those who want to come to communion to ask of themselves that question. Where am I? Is my life surrendered to you? Are you Lord? Are you Savior? Or am I doing this thing for a different reason? For those of you who may not know, if you're a visitor, I'm really sorry. I didn't intend for this to be heavy for you today. But the bread, it represents the body of Christ. The wine, it represents His blood. Jesus died on the cross to make a way for you to be free from sin and the consequences of sin, which is eternal separation from God. Eternal. 
And the Bible says if you would surrender your life, if you would repent, meaning I turn away from the old, I give my life completely to Jesus. If, if, I, if I go for that with everything inside of me, there will be evidence and fruit in your life to speak of that. If you were to do that, then you will be saved. And God will welcome you into His family and fill you with His Holy Spirit. And so today as you come to partake in communion, once you're finished, you can make your way back. I'm going to conclude the service here, really. But it's business between you and the Lord. The Bible says, be careful that you don't take communion in an unworthy manner. I will caution, I'll warn you against that. Don't be fooled that because you call yourself a Christian, that you are truly saved. I urge you, go through the same grapple that I'm busy with in my life at the moment. Come before the Lord, kind of God Almighty, am I deceived? Where have I missed it? Where am I on the wrong path? And if I am, bring me back to you. Nikki, will you minister to us? And then I wonder, just as you feel when you're ready, please come and help yourself. There'll be people at the tables to help you. And do business with the Lord. Even as you go from here this afternoon, go speak, go pray, go seek. Now, there's something in your heart that spoke to you today and you want to fix whatever there is in your heart today. Come and see me now. Come see me now. And we'll stand together and we'll pray together. Amen? Amen. Let's have communion.